Hi, hello, um, and welcome everybody to this morning's webinar looking at social trends for 2024. I'm Linda Coburn and I'm the webinar producer for The Space. I am a middle-aged white woman wearing glasses and um, the most enormous blue scarf because it's a bit cold this morning. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of an overview, explain what's going to happen, and then I'm going to hand over to Amrit Singh, who's our speaker, our presenter today. And I wanted to start by um, just giving a little bit of information about the space, if we're not an organisation that you already know. So the space are um, a, a, the UK's Digital Commissioning and Development Agency for Arts and Culture. As you can see, we've been working for a few years in this domain, really, and the big core of our work is commissioning digital work from and with arts and cultural organizations and so those all those case studies really inform the um the skills development part of our work which is where the webinar comes into it so, and you can find out more about the projects on our website so we're also a sector support um an ipso funded by the arts council support agency and have been for this year so really really invested in what goes on in the arts and in sharing the skills that we develop uh, through the programmes that we run. Um, and just a bit about how we're going to work today and what will happen. So um, the the two things that are key really are thinking about the how, how we work. So we use the chat, as you will see, to talk to one another, to ask questions of Amrit, our panellists, and also to have discussions. And we're also going to experiment a bit today with um, trying polls we're not sure how it'll work or how how it might add to the the content but we thought it would it's worth a go so just bear in mind this is probably the first time we've done this in one of our webinars um so there will be polls popped in along the way um but chat's key really as a way of um communicating between yourselves and with us um and also we have a live captioner with us jen who's here today and She's explained that um, she's found the captioning, the like, the captioning information is all in the chat. Um, and she's explained that she's found it to be quite glitchy recently. So if there are any problems with it, we apologise, but we, there's not much we can do. But she's suggesting that you use the um, the stream text link instead and it'll, you'll get a better service from that. So the information is there in in the um, in the chat about that. And also to say that the webinar will be recorded and available after the event on our YouTube channel. And also that there will be slides available. So if you would like the slides afterwards, you'll um, need to email events at the space.org for the links. OK, so that's that's really how we'll work. And then, as you can see, we've got a schedule which it's. Um, I'll be handing over to Amrit just in a minute. He'll he'll appear on screen. And then really, this is the structure that we're working through and there'll be time for questions. So it's, it's, it's presentation led with time for questions in between the sections. And about 11.50, we'll take a really short screen break so that everybody can rest their eyes and catch a breath um, and so on. Um, and I think that's all I need to say just now. I'm going to, I, yeah, Amit will introduce himself and, and I'll just drop in with questions or whatever as we go along as needed. So thanks very much. I hope you enjoy it. As Amrit always does a really good talk back packed with information. So this one will be no different. So Amrit, over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Linda. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, exciting webinar all about social media trends uh, in 2024. I will be asking you some questions throughout my presentation. I know for a fact that you're all cold and your fingers are going to get really stiff. So just to flex your fingers and, and make them work a bit harder this morning, you'll be typing away in the chat, hopefully, as we go on. All right, so let me share my presentation and then I'll do my intro as well. Okay, can I get a thumbs up if you can see this? Yeah, perfect, good. So welcome everyone, like I said, social media trends, we're exploring the evolving social media landscape, which is never ending, it seems. And my name is Amrit Singh. I am the creative director at Rebel Creatives. Uh, we specialize in short form video production, strategy, social media marketing. 
and we deliver a lot of training and um, workshops. I'm also an artist and you can see some of the lovely artwork on the screen. And I've been creating content professionally for about 10 years now for brands from Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, directly working with them. And, um, and I'm also a space associate as well, working with this lovely organization for a few years now on mentoring um consulting on digital project uh, projects and also webinars and talks like this i'm also a brown individual uh, of indian descent i'm wearing a turban and i've got a beard wearing a burnt orange jumper so let's get into it so uh, linda's already kind of ran through the agenda so we'll skip through this and uh, let's talk about the social media landscape in 2023 before let me just quickly open chat so i've got the chat on the screen there we go and we are all ready to go. Perfect. So the major trends this year, there's been quite a few. Now, just to be of an overview as well, um, this is a, a, a short webinar. If we wanted to, we could spend three days talking about the trends on uh, that have happened this year and that have happened next year as well. So it's kind of an overview. Uh, I definitely uh, ex um, suggest a lot of you guys take notes of the major trends and do a bit of uh, research into kind of how they will or have impacted yourself as well so the top trends that i've noticed from this year number one uh, we've got authenticity and transparency so audiences craved genuine connections and appreciated brands that showed their human side it's a huge part nowadays so i want to break this into a, a bit more into detail as well and uh, number two short form video um like tiktok Reels, Instagram, and um, YouTube Shorts, they've gained significant traction this year. Number three is micro-influencer marketing. So collaborations with niche influencers with a loyal following have provided highly effective. And then number four, we've got social commerce. So social media platforms expanding their e-commerce capabilities, enabling seamless shopping experiences. And finally, number five, we've got UGC, standing for user-generated content. So brands embraced UGC to foster community engagement and build trust. So let's break these down and figure out what exactly are they. Oh, number six, <laughs> AI text generator tools, really important. Okay, so authenticity and transparency. Audiences were increasingly drawn to brands that showcase their human sides and foster genuine connections. Now, I know if you guys asked yourself this question, who, what do you prefer out of brands that are faceless or brands that have a conversation with their community? I know for a fact that majority of you will say, I really appreciate brands who talk with their first name, sign off with their names and actually talk to us as if we're individuals. So authenticity and transparency is huge. Uh, a study by Sprout Social found that 86% of consumers believe authenticity was crucial in deciding which brands they supported. And according to a report by Edelman, 63% of consumers globally say that they trust brands that were transparent about their practices. So there's two parts here, brands that were transparent and then about the practices as well. Uh, from a content creation point of view, your goal as well by, of arts organizations isn't just to create uh, followers or even fans your goal is to create advocates and the best way that I found from myself as a content creator and also working with brands as well is being open by how you do your day-to-day -day things and practices ups and downs and, and also celebrations as well so in the ever-evolving social media landscape authenticity and transparency were essential for building genuine connections with audiences and creatives like yourselves hold the power of, craft, of crafting uh, compelling content that resonates with audiences on a personal level. So by embracing authenticity and transparency, brands established trust, loyalty, and achieved sustainable success. Number two, short form video. So short form video exemplified by TikTok Reels, uh, sorry, TikTok Instagram Reels and revolutionized the social media landscape. So we've got three major platforms doing quite well this year. We've got TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube Shorts. Um, so according to a study by Sista, the global number of social media users who watch short form videos daily is projected to reach 2.6 billion by 2025. It's a huge amount. And also the average TikTok user spends approximately 52 minutes per day watching videos. Now, some of you guys might be a lot more than that, no judgment here. And some of you guys might be a lot less than that. So that's fine. Biggest reason short form video has massively changed the, the market is because of our attention span. So last year, the attention span for majority of users who are using social media or short form video platforms was three seconds. Now you might think that's really, really low. 
which is less than a goldfish. But this year, it's 1.2 seconds. 1.2 seconds. I'm going to say that again, One point, just in case you got distracted. No, 1.2 seconds. Now, that's a good thing and a bad thing. The bad thing from content creators and people who, like myself, who direct campaigns on social media, we have to make sure that the hook to hook people into watching your video is there in the first 1.2 seconds. So the biggest thing I want you to think about is as we explore these and you are thinking about, you might be th thinking about producing short form videos or you already are, how are you hooking in your viewers within the first 1.2 seconds? The reason also short form video has been quite popular is because of the global reach and the, de the democratization of content creation and consumption. So anyone, can create content with minimal barriers to entry, allowing for a diverse range of voices and perspectives to be heard. That's exactly what we want. As creators and also as consumers, we want to see or hear voices from all over the world, from different backgrounds, and also the traditional media model of consumption and creation has completely changed. So originally, there were a few major players um, that you would have to create content and submit content to be seen in the media industry. But now it's the opposite way around where brands and individuals can actually do very, very well, be very, very successful, and then potentially reach out to certain media, media organizations for TV shows or movies or even brand deals. Next, we have micro-influencer marketing. So micro and nano-influencer marketing has emerged as a transformative trend this year. Collaborations with niche influencers who possess a loyal and engaged following have proven highly effective in driving brand awareness and engagement. According to a study by Influencer Marketing Hub, micro-influencer campaigns generate an average engage engagement rate of 5% compared to 1.3% for mega-influencers. Just to be of an explanation on what that means. So micro and nanos, you might have heard this, these terms, you might not. Micro influencers are those who kind of have tens of thousands or below 10,000 followers, let's say. And nano influencers are those who have tens of thousands onwards. So like tens of thousands between up to 100,000. And um, some of you guys who will be watching might be in that category, which is fantastic. And all of your organizations might be in this category as well. And you'll notice that your engagement rate is actually really high compared to those um, influencers. And we've worked with a number of influencers who have 1 million plus followers and their engagement is a lot lower due to many reasons. It could be that their followers have stopped using the platform and some have probably bought followers. There's a number of reasons. But yeah, micro and nano influencers are something that you should definitely be focusing on this year and even in the future as well. And 82% of consumers believe micro-influencer recommendations are more authentic than those from celebrities. It's huge. Next, we have social commerce. Now, I want you to drop a, a yes in the chat if you've bought anything from social media this year. Now, there's platforms out there like TikTok that's selling products directly in the app. It'd be interesting to see who has actually bought anything. So with the integration of e-commerce functionalities uh, within social media platforms, it's emerged as a popular way. Wow, there's a lot of people. Good. Go on. Anyone else? Users can effectively discover, browse, and purchase products without leaving their preferred social media platforms. 57% um, so of consumers have made a purchase directly on social media platforms. Um, which is insane. So uh, obviously we're looking at the platforms, uh, sorry, the chat, and we've got a good amount of yeses, which is really good. So you know how easy it is to watch and consume content on platforms like TikTok. And you might even see your favorite creator, micro or macro influencer, showing you a really cool product. And then the shop link is directly on the video that you can buy. And the, the price is very, very competitive. So social commerce is actually changing the landscape completely. All of a sudden, Social media isn't just about consuming, uh, creating, and engaging. It's also now about selling. Um, and the biggest part of this is creators can actually make a decent amount of money through sales. Next, we have user-generated content. So UGC fosters a sense of community, encourages brand loyalty, and promotes authentic connections with consumers. It serves as social proof, enhancing brand credibility and trust amongst customers. So um, when I say the term user-generated content, a lot of people think, oh, I've never really heard that, or what is that? But in fact, everything on social media when it comes to TikTok or Reels or YouTube Shorts or anything that's created on Facebook is, 
content created by you. So any content created by you that's not paid by the advertiser, not, it's not paid by a brand, is user-generated content. Now, in fact, this is probably, this is like gold dust in terms of all the content that you can create or that you uh, hope to have as a brand. This is the type of content that has been hugely popular this year. For example, imagine you're a museum or you're a theater, for example, and you wanted to promote a show. Uh, tra traditionally, um, there's been this uh, kind of way of working with museums and, and theaters, which is no photography and no videography. You know, for a lot of museums, you couldn't go in and take photographs. You couldn't take photographs of any production. But that's changed massively this year, where the uh, companies are realizing that, in fact, if we allow people to create content and record videos and share it on that platform, we're going to gain more people to come and actually view these exhibitions because of the FOMO element, the fear of missing out. So it's worked massively. So a lot of uh, museums have now dropped the signs of no photography and no videography, which is brilliant. And they've seen a huge increase in visitors to their museums or theatres or even ticket sales because they've seen snippets of the performance or snippets of the exhibition or galleries shared on TikTok or Reels or Shorts through user-generated content. So 79% of consumers trust UGC more than traditional advertising. Huge. In fact, I know the fact I've been to quite a lot of exhibitions recently this year, purely because someone who I followed has been there and shared, shared their insight of why I should be going there. And 86% of millennials are more, more likely to trust a brand that features UGC on its website or social media pl uh, platforms. Next, we have AI generated tools. The emergence of AI power tools that generate human quality text has transformed content creation this year, enabling users to create a wide range of content formats, including social media posts, blog articles, and marketing copy. So examples are ChatGPT, HiveMind, Bard, Word AI, CurlBot, I've said Bard twice then, <laughs> Microsoft, and Microsoft being Chat. So can uh, who here I would drop a yes in the chat if you've used any AI text generated tools this year? Be interested. Well, loads, that's a lot more than the other one. Okay, pretty much everyone, good. That's actually a good indication of kind of how much I could talk about this. Right, very good. Um, so did you know that 82% of marketers believe that AI will play a significant role in their content marketing strategies within the next five years? So it's a huge amount. By embracing AI text generators and implementing creative strategies, brands saw that they could streamline their content creation process, empower their creative teams, and achieve significant growth in the ever-evolving social media realm. A uh, quick case study that I want to share with you guys is the Met. Um, the Met embraced short form video content a lot more this year than it has done previously, creating engaging and educational educational art history videos on TikTok and on Instagram. Um, their TikTok increased uh, quite well this year with over 200,000 followers and its Instagram reels consistently garnered very high engagement. Um, there's another shout out as well, which is with the Black uh, Country Living Museum, who's uh, amassed 1.2 million followers on TikTok with a clever use of short form video. Unfortunately, though, it looks like that they've stopped posting or very rarely post, which is a shame. So I don't tend to use as much as I really would love to because they're a local uh, company. Um, I don't really use them as an example anymore because they went through a huge increase and then now they've kind of slowed down. Um, I hope if you are from there or watching, please do create content. <laughs> it was fantastic. Okay. Uh, so key takeaway, um, leveraging trend formats and showcasing the music re collection is in a relatable way resonate with audiences. So a big part that we love to see from museums. So I mentioned user generated content. Not only uh, are museums like the Met and other brands in the UK sharing or adopting short form video in a really interesting way where they can showcase um, outfits or exhibitions or upcoming information, but also sneak peeks and what's to come. But the biggest thing is they are actually asking their audience to share their perception on exhibitions, which is actually very, very cool. Cool. So before we go on to the next uh, section, which is emerging platforms, I want to ask if you guys have got any questions and do this fancy new poll thing that Linda was talking about. Risha, do you want to put the poll, the first poll question up? 
And also, as, as Amrit is saying, if anybody has any questions, um, will you write them into chat and we can just see if there's any anything that we want to pick up just now. There'll be more time for questions at the end as well. Yes. Okay. So we're just going to, we'll leave the poll there for just for a minute. If you want to go for it, answer it, then that will, that will be really helpful and interesting. So, so far, Amrit, we haven't got any particular questions on this section, but that's fine. I think we usually get more questions at the end anyway. So yeah, no problem. We'll just give um, it just, cool. just a side note, I will be kind of having these little Q&A breaks. Uh, so for the next part, please do uh, drop a question in the chat or feel free to leave it towards the end as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued to see what you would say, what your answer is. And did any of these trends influence your social media use in the last year so just to recap in fact while this is on mm -hmm. um these are the trends we we're talking about so mm -hmm. we've got authenticity and transparency short form video micro influencer marketing social commerce user generated content and ai text generated tools thank you and there um, there is now there's a question from katie there which says um uh, can we survive without using TikTok? We don't have dedicated marketing capacity, and it's one platform too many. And I'm sure yeah. there's a sort of very general, a more general response to that. Yeah, um, I mean that's a great question, Katie. So the thing about um, TikTok is, I think it's important for us to realize that TikTok is just one platform, even though it's doing very, very well. Your goal should be to diversify your content, and what I mean about that is by creating short form video uh, content, which you should definitely be doing. And by the way, I know if you're a one, so I, I work with a lot of arts organizations and theaters. And in fact, I run a practical uh, short form video workshop. And what a lot of people realize is that it doesn't cr take a lot of time to create short form videos. At first, when you think about short form videos, it, it seems like it's this whole production. But if you think about recording one to three second videos throughout your day at work, and then just compiling them together on a third party app or within TikTok, it actually takes 10 minutes if that um but the biggest thing here is uh, forget about the tiktok think about creating short form video platform uh, content to first share on the platforms that you're currently on that you currently have an audience and then repurpose and reuse those content on tiktok by just simply sharing it if you need to so that's the biggest thing i would i would say with that is um don't focus too much on how can we do something for another platform is how can we create uh, uh, content for your existing community for your existing audience and when you do have a bit of time just repurpose it to tiktok and then see what happens lovely thank you um and so uh, there's another couple of questions. There's one, somebody saying, and how do you encourage uh, any any sort of tips on how to encourage user-generated content other than removing restrictions on photography and videography? Yeah, great question, Helen. So the other way that um, some theatres and organ and museums that we work with have done that is by creating content on social media and then encouraging their, or asking their users to create content responding to your content. So... <clears throat> Let's say you've got a fantastic uh, exhibition and it's all about a certain theme or uh, artifacts or a gallery from an artist. You would then record content yourself, showcasing the sneak peeks and the behind the scenes, or you would get someone just talking about the reason why this artwork is displayed here. What is it? Or you get the artist to do it. Then your call to action here, really important here. Every single short form video should have a call to action. What do you want your users to do? So in your call to action on your video or in your caption, you should be inviting your users, your audience, your community to create content themselves. So you should, for example, say, um, what do you think of the artwork here? Please respond with a video or with images. The hard part here is educating your community that this is going to become the new norm. Because if your community isn't used to you asking for these kind of stuff, it will take a while for them just to do it, do it in the first place. But once they get used to you asking these questions, you'll start to get some really cool user generated content. Lovely, thank you. So, I guess you can see the responses to the um, to the poll that eighty nine percent of people oh, have been influenced by the trends this year. Oh, fantastic! So really, yeah, yeah. So it's obviously we're we're in the right space here, aren't we? Yeah. Good. Okay. Um. There's there's a couple of other questions as well. There's one about AI, but I'm going to put that poke pause that because we'll come back to AI later on and have a bit yeah. more of a chance to speak about that and yeah. um and then somebody's asking just are videos more effective than not than stills which you get on Instagram that's a question yes. at 1123 
Yeah, so uh, Jitya, very good question. Um, yes, the answer is. And the reason why the answer is yes is because of the algorithms that these platforms are prioritizing. So if we look at, let's say, three years ago, four years ago, the algorithm from uh, Instagram, Facebook was prioritizing uh, to images that was the big thing that they were uh, posting uh, sorry pushing more than text-based um, platform uh, uh, posts however the algorithm nowadays this year is any any type of short form video between 15 to 30 seconds is kind of the sweet spot so yes the answer is yes okay smashing thank you okay so uh, i think we should carry on amrit yeah. oh sorry Yes, no, we'll, we'll carry on. I just want to quickly answer one other question before we do, uh, which is, I think I saw it about which, uh, Anna, what is the best and easiest app to quickly make short form video? Um, the, if I, if you guys rec uh, if you guys write down the name InShot or CapCut, those are very, very simple. I've been using InShot, I-N-S-H-O-T. I've been using InShot for eight years now. Every single one of the videos I share on my platforms and the videos that we use with freelancers and content creators on the go is all edited within InShot. It's um, a fantastic platform. It's free, but you, there is a paid version as well. Great. Um, yeah, let's carry on. And any other questions, please do ask them right at the end as well. Yeah, uh, I'll keep an eye. Fantastic. Okay. Next, let's talk about emerging platforms. Oh, no, I've already... To do... Yes, there you go, emerging platforms. Okay. So first of all, Threads. Threads is a kind of newish social media app that emphasizes privacy and um, text-based information predominantly, but then you've also kind of got uh, images uh, that they've also exper experimenting with as well. Users can create threads, which are essentially private group chats that dis disappear after 24 hours. Uh, the nature, this type of kind of uh, content fosters open and honest conversation, making threads an appealing platform for personal connections and discussions. And the potential benefits of threads, so I'm not sure, so some of you guys might have used threads or not, um, but threads is a Potential benefits from this one, you can host exclusive Q&A sessions with creatives or art experts, create private communities for supporters and patrons, share behind the scenes glimpses of creative processes, and facilitate discussions and feedback on new works or exhibitions. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys were probably forced to have threads, uh, and then you have threads, it's kind of difficult to get rid of as well, but it's something that a lot of people they saw a huge, huge increase. Uh, I have kind of used it here and there, but the thing from me, and I'm sure it's from you as well, a lot of people is it's another platform. And do I have the time to invest in another platform when I'm already using Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and TikTok? Um, challenges, limited discoverability due to private centric approach, uh, need to actively engage users to main, main, maintain momentum and potential for misuse, if not used responsibly. But the biggest thing here is it's another platform, uh, especially because it's part of the whole meta um, approach, meta, sorry, umbrella. So that's one, is threads. Um, please do drop a yes in the chat if you've used threads this year yourself or organizations. I think that'd be really interesting to see. Okay, cool. Good, a good amount as well. Um, feel free to also share if you still use it. <laughs> Yes, but only briefly, first year. only at the start. Exactly, only at the start. No? Yeah. Okay. Weekly. Cool. I can see, so that's good. It's kind of good. There's a bunch of yeses where I think all of us joined. And then now we're like, pretty much no. Keep forgetting, just it, Justin or Justine. Um, that's exactly what I do. I keep forgetting about threads. <laughs> Very good. Next, we have Blue Sky Social. Now, Blue Sky is a decentralized social media platform that aims to address concerns about censorship and privacy on traditional platforms. The protocol is still under development, uh, but it promises to give users more control over the data on how their interactions are moderated. So Twitter co-founder Jack uh, and XMPP creator Jeremy sit on the board of directors. So it's really interesting that now, obviously, Jack Dorsey, who was the founder of Twitter, who kind of got kicked out of Twitter when Elon took over, um, is now kind of creating this new platform. As of this month, 
Blue Sky is still in beta with reg registration only available to those with an invite, but the company has outlined its plans for eventually roll out to the general public. So you can download the app and you can basically put your email address to receive an invite, but you're on the waiting list. Um, the service is focused on microblogging, again, what Twitter kind of was and still is, um, and has been called as Twitter-like. So just something just to, um, it has proved quite popular. So I've spoken to people who have had the invite and they've been using, so you can see these screenshots from uh, what it looks like. It pretty much looks like Twitter, exactly the same. Um, it's, um, so that's going to be quite interesting to see what happens when it does get rolled out to the general public. Uh, potential benefits of this, so we've got greater freedom of expression and artistic freedom, reduced risk of censorship or shadow banning, banning potential for more direct interactions with followers. Uh, the challenges, however, are complexity of the decentralized model may deter some users, limited user base and potential for slow adoption, and uncertainties regarding monetization and sustainability. So biggest uh, part is number three here is so one, when there's a new platform out there, majority of people just jump from one platform to another, especially if it's very, very similar. So the thing about Threads is Threads was a little bit unique because there wasn't a platform that did exactly what Threads did. Um, yes, you can kind of say Twitter, but it was quite unique in terms of what you, what you um, offered. But again, most people forgot about it. Um, the thing about Blue Sky is if it pr proves very, very successful and it does what we wanted Twitter to do before it became X, then majority I could I can see majority of people just going straight to Blue Sky and using that um, because of their affiliations or the, their connections to Elon or maybe what he represents or what he's trying to do with X. So I think that's kind of the biggest thing. But then the question mark that I have is sustainability. Do you want to invest a lot of time in the platform that maybe next year or, or halfway next year they just realize they just feel like you know what let's just forget it let's just uh, we don't have investment or we don't want to we don't know how to move forward but definitely something to think about and keep on your radar um the, the biggest tip i will say to any of these platforms is register account the first thing that you should be doing is just securing your handle right so your handle is your brand that represents your entire organization if this does do really well and someone else takes your handle or your organization name, it'll be quite annoying, right? So the first thing I do <clears throat> as a content creator and as a brand, and when I'm working with others and from a strategy point of view, any emerging platform, register, secure the handle, and then we'll see what happens, right? We might use it, we might not use it, but as long as we've got the handle, then everything's all good. Next, we have Be Real. So as one of the pretty much newest social media platforms, obviously Blue Sky is also new, but it's not technically released yet. Be Real markets itself as the simplest social media platform. With mainstream social media platforms encourage individuals to post the highlights of their lives, Be Real wants to change it. So Be Real encourages users to share a single unfiltered photo or video once a day at a random time. This emphasizes on authenticity and spontaneity uh, but it's, re it's resonated massively with Gen Z users who are tired of staged and curated content. So we know for a fact that everything on Instagram is very much staged and curated. So if you look at your major creators or, or influencers on Instagram, um, the biggest question that I've seen this year is that's fake. It's created. It's done for the camera. It's, it, was, it was a dress up. It's not real. It's, um, it's heavily edited biggest these are the comments that you get so be real what tries to change that which is all right you get notification you've got within a kind of a time frame to post post whatever you can um for me personally i tried using it uh, earlier this year it, it just didn't work with my workflow so um i use social media when i post whenever i can whenever i have time to kind of post or share something or even with creators if I had a random uh, notification when I'm doing something or I'm working with someone and I'm thinking about, oh, what do I do? It kind of created more anxiety, if I'm honest, than actually uh, creating um, authentic content that I feel like my users will enjoy. Personally, if I'm not working. Yeah, so drop a uh, yes if you use it, no if you don't use it. Um, in the chat, if you use Be Real, I'd be really interested to know this. I think more, more knows on... But pressure to join, yeah. Personal use only. 
and I've heard of it used but stopped. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Karen's like, no, get it out of my face. Um, so potential benefits is to showcase the creative process in a raw and unfiltered way, connect with audiences on a more personal level, and generate excitement and anticipation around upcoming events and projects. The challenges are limited scope for curated content and storytelling, potential for users to feel pressured to share their lives constantly, and may not appeal to older audiences who are accustomed to traditional social media formats. So yeah, just like in the chat, I got you, I got it, but I got bored. Uh, but loads of uni students use it, exactly that. So um, when I lecture at a number of universities and I always kind of ask these questions and get the kind of the feel, a lot of Gen Zs use it, but it, it's good for them because Be Real is kind of uh, replacing Snapchat. Now, there's another section that we've taken out, but it's going to be on the PDF, by the way, which is declining trends and tr declining platforms. Snapchat was one of them. Um, Be Real has kind of overtaken Snapchat. Snapchat was a fantastic way that you could take... Um, photographs and videos there and then and just share it raw and authentic and it was really popular with a younger audience like gen z's um so now be, uh, we have a lot of uni students who are just kind of walking around uh their campus or in class just taking a quick picture done it works perfectly for them because people also want to see what they're doing you know they're very curious that generation well we all are in general um as to what are they doing right now at that moment at a specific time yeah they can still stage it, be real, but they've got a short window to do it. So, I mean, if you're very quick thinking, uh, brilliant. Yeah, that's very, very good. But it's still a little bit more authentic than Instagram. But it has, it has its challenges. Uh, cool. So next, I want to focus on industry insights from the um, this section. So we've got the early adopter. Creatives tend to be slow when experimenting with emerging platforms. That's just a general thing. Out of all the kind of... Uh, sec sec sectors I've worked with, artists and creatives really are a little bit slow. Um, the potential for creative engagement is huge. and But the biggest thing that we want to do is we want to see what it's like to be an early adopter. Um, I've been quite lucky in my kind of social media uh, content creation uh, life where I've been an early adopter three times on platforms. So first was Instagram, two was Periscope, which is now gone, but I did very, very well on Periscope. And three was Vine, rest in peace, which I also did very, very well, but unfortunately it's gone. <laughs> so it was it's, it was fascinating being part of a platform that no one knew, platforms that no one knew what would happen. Um, but it, if you was an early adopter and you use it creatively, it could really benefit your brand um, massively. Uh, and then, but the question here is, how do you diversify your content and not focus on one platform only? That's the biggest one that I learned. Biggest, uh, I invested a lot of time and effort into Vine and it went and I was furious at the creators <laughs> of Twitter. I invested a lot of time in Periscope and that took eight years to go. So that was a lot better. Um, but with Vine, I did put all my eggs in one basket. I know a lot of creators did that. So we've learned, we learned the hard way, but we learned now to diversify our content to as many kind of uh, platforms, but a focus on the content creation and sustainability of repurposing platforms, uh, repurposing content. Uh, emerging platforms offer unique opportunities for art organizations and artists to connect with audiences in new and meaningful ways. Uh, however, the importance of carefully evaluating each platform's strengths, limitations, and target audiences is in to ensure strategic approach is key. So the one thing I want you to focus on, on all of these emerging trends that I've already spoken about, so we've got Be Real, Blue Sky, and Threads, and there's many more, is what are the platform strengths? What are the limitations? Right. And what is the target audience? You might find that some of these platforms are just a completely different target audience that your overall marketing strategy just doesn't want to focus on. Um, really important to focus on that. Practical tips when it comes to emerging platforms. Number one, define clear goals. So determine what you aim to achieve by being on these platforms. Biggest question. And mo most um, organizations that I work with don't actually answer that question. So what, are you, what, are you, what do you want to achieve? Uh, and, and there's nothing wrong by the way, of having a very specific purpose for a specific platform. I, I definitely know there's certain organizations just have one, they just want to promote one thing and they know they have one target audience and they're going to focus on that. Uh, next is to experiment and adapt. So be open to experimentation and adjust your strategies to learn. So 
Social media in general is, is a huge experimentation tool. There's nothing, there's no defined rule, in, in fact, on how to use it and how not to use it. And because the algorithms are constantly changing, so we've invested a lot of time in trying to understand the algorithms of uh, TikTok and Instagram Reels this, this year, and we've pretty much got it down really well. However, I know for a fact in three years' time, it's three months' time, in fact, um, they'll change. They'll completely change. And then we have to go back to square one and like, all right, the focus was this. And now it's going to be something completely different. But the best way of understanding it is to experiment. And uh, so what I always recommend is, for example, creating content, posting it, seeing how it does, check the analytics, write that all down. And then maybe in three weeks time, either delete it or repost it again at a different time, different caption, different duration and length and see what happens. Uh, there's nothing wrong with doing that. And, and you'll find out, you'll figure out um, best practices in terms of times, caption length, hashtags, all that kind of stuff will come to you quite naturally through experiment experimentations. Uh, next, we have encourage audience participation. Huge. This is the biggest, one of the biggest trends this year is making your audience as part of your platform, part of your, your profile and, and, and community. You want to foster a sense of community by inviting feedback and engagement. Um, I mentioned call to action, which is really what every single one of you guys should be doing at the end of every single one of your posts. One of your call to actions could be inviting feedback. What do you think of this? What should we show next? Which exhibitions would you like? Um, any questions, any answers, those type of uh, call to actions are huge when it comes to valuing your audience and making them part of your community and building that community uh, overall. Number four, we want to maintain consistency. Now, this is a difficult one because you want to regular, regularly post content to keep your audience engaged. But again, some of you guys might question, we're a one-man team. You know, we're, we don't have a, a huge marketing team. We don't have a huge marketing budget. So what do we do? Consistency doesn't mean posting every hour or every single day. Consistency could mean posting once a week. But what you have to do is you have to create content for the platform and not just your audiences. This was a game changer for me as a content creator when somebody, when I uh, went to a content creator, a very experienced content creator, and he said to me, he goes, Amrit, you're at the moment, you're just creating content for your audience, but you're not actually creating content for the platform. And, I, and that, what, what he meant by that which was a complete game changer was you're supposed to educate the, the platform on why they should be pushing your content out and educating the, the platform on when you're going to be posting consistently. So they know. So for example, on TikTok, you should be differentiating your videos based on keywords through SEO in the caption and the hashtag. And also if you can try posting a certain day at a time and keep it on a regular basis or a certain time at a day at a time. So what the algorithm does, it, tend, it knows that, right, you are going to be posting on a Monday at uh, 12, a, 12 p.m. And it's going to expect uh, a post next Monday at 12 p.m. And then next Monday at 12 p.m. And what you'll see, what you'll notice is the algorithm was to start to push your video out to more of your audiences or people who want to see your audiences because of the consistency. So when I say um, maintain consistency, don't think it's every single day. That's just um, not, that's not, that doesn't work for a lot of people. Um, if it's once a week, at least minimum, then that will work really, really well. Uh, and next we have monitor performance. So track your progress and analyze metrics to measure effectiveness. So um, you'll be surprised how many people have never seen the insights on their posts or have never seen the analytics and they've just kind of seen the really broad one that pops up at the bottom. But I definitely recommend if you can, even if you're um, scrolling through your phone right now, choose a post that, you, that did well and choose a post that didn't do well. Look at the analytics and look at the demographics, time of day. Look at um, uh, out of the people that you follow and the people that you did or don't follow, which of those categories was your post uh, um, directed to, really? Um, ideally, what we want, we want on the uh, pie chart, we want more people. We want our videos to be sent to more people who don't follow you than people who you do follow. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the algorithms just kind of post share your videos to your followers. Now, if you've got a small follower count, then that's not going to be great. Ideally, you want it to be eighty percent or more to people you don't follow, so then you can turn them into followers uh, later on, or with with a call to action. 
So emerging social media platforms present an exciting opportunity for arts organizations and artists to expand their reach, connect with diverse audiences, and showcase their creativity in innovative ways. While each platform has its unique features and challenges, understanding their potential and approaching them strategically can enhance communication, engagement, and impact. By embracing experimentation and staying informed, arts organizations and creatives can effectively navigate the evolving social media landscape. So we're going to go to Q&As if you've got any questions or the poll before we head into the break. We're not going to do the poll, Anne, because you've asked the questions that we were going to, so it's just doing it. Oh, okay. Yes, and organically was great. Lovely. Thank you. So you, we've covered that, really. All right, brilliant. Okay. Okay. So Sorry. everyone's dropped, uh, everyone's answered the poll. But that's yeah. like any questions. So I'm sure there's a bunch of questions I can ask before the break then. Yeah, we've got we've got one there saying, um, do you think there's a potential for a swing into long form content that can be seen in TikTok, extending their video lengths up to 10 minutes? The rise of the daily vlogger post. Is this something you've come across? Yes. So I know for a fact that Twitter is definitely experimenting with longer formats. They, um, so here's a, just a side note, though. Um, Twitter's strategy has changed massively in the last year or so. So last year, their goal was to take over um, threads and be better than Meta. That was their goal. However, the goal this year has changed to being better than Google. They want to be the search engine that young people and all generations go to to search for stuff. But that also includes being taken over YouTube because they know that YouTube is technically the third, I think, largest social media platform still with billions of hours of content watched on a monthly basis, um, even though it's long form. However, a lot of people are still watching, consuming short form as well. So even though right now, and I think even next year, short form still will be king, you know, 15 to 30 seconds is what people are, especially with the short attention span with 1.2 seconds, people are craving bite-sized snackable content. However, TikTok is experimenting with longer form, which is 10 minute plus, but people aren't quite there yet. It's kind of do. I I feel like in five years time there's gonna be a full circle from long form YouTube formats to short form to now people are adopting eventually long form vertical formats. It's not gonna be landscape. It will be vertical going forward, but not yet. That's gonna be a, something in the future. Hmm. So the next question down is about is asking, do you think that Threads could be a replacement for Twitter? But in, in answering this question, what a thing that was asked of us in advance, a couple of the ones came in was saying. Um, what should, so like, what should organisations who rely on Twitter be doing now? And should we delete our Twitter account? And I suppose it's the whole th issue of what happens with Twitter. It might be we, we don't expect you to have the answer, but it would be interesting to hear your answer. And maybe there's people in the audience who have a take on it as well. But yeah, so that, sure. you know, I mean, could threads take over from Twitter, and what do we do about that? So there's just side note. I don't think uh, that person meant threads because threads definitely won't take over. It's Blue Sky is probably the app oh, that you right. meant. Um, so Blue Sky potentially could take over Twitter, but here's the thing though, Twitter has about 250 million users, um, which is under the billion count compared to the other platforms. And Blue Sky, which is going to be the Twitter equivalent, has, I think at the moment, less than 10,000 because it's still in the invite stage. And then even then, once it gets rolled out. So let's say um, Blue Sky does what Threads did, which um, was quite successful in its rollout, which I think he had 1 million within like a week. It still needs to push people sharing it as much as possible. It has a huge promise because you've got Jack Dorsey who created Twitter on the board of directors, board of directors of Blue Sky, and there's a there's been a huge backlash to a certain point with Elon's way of working. For example, you know a lot of people were they loved the Twitter brand. A lot of people don't like the X brand. They don't like how it's been kind of pushed. So I, I definitely see a lot of people jumping to blue sky and then they if if they feel like they are getting engagement like for example your uh, return investment right would be or your strategy would be if i post a link onto blue sky i want to see how many clicks i get to my website if i'm getting zero constantly but i'm getting 10 at least on twitter then you would be like right let's just focus back on twitter but the biggest thing is experimentation right there's no yes or no answer until you jump on that platform, experiment, see if your audience is also jumping on that platform. Remember, there's no, it doesn't really matter if you jump on that platform, but you want your audience to be on that platform as well. And then once you start posting 
few times, you kind of see the analytics, see if people actually do click on your website, sign up to your mailing list, buy a ticket, whatever. Um, then you can truly understand or figure out whether the platform is going to have uh, is, is a platform for you or not. Mm, OK, thank you very much. And again, it, you know, it might be a discussion between between people in the audience because it is it's sort of like you sort of see something decreasing. It's still the most, yeah. you know, that is still going to have like the biggest said, engagement. 200, yeah, 250 million users still use Twitter. It's not like it's, it's gone. It's still uh, very, very active. It's just people are craving something different. Hence why this platform is, is coming coming out. OK, so um, we've got three questions, Amrit, but the, there's one about uh, making accessible um, content for deaf and visually impaired audiences. And what I'm going to suggest is that we've got resources about that. So we might put some links in um, unless there's something particular that you want to say about that. But we've got lots of resources we can share. Then there's one about working remotely, which, again, we'll uh, we can think. I think that's a sort of question to the audience, really. It's about how yeah. do you how do you come together? A sort of bigger question than what we're really dealing with here. The third thing is about um, the the paid for budgets. I don't know mm. if that's the eleven fifty question. I wonder if they might you might have a response to that. Cool. Um, so just to sort of end. Quick question. So first one, definitely, Katie, um, to your question, uh, I'd recommend checking out the articles, but every single platform nowadays has accessible features, which do cater to people who are deaf or visually impaired, um, subtitles, um, audio uh, description, the subtitles and auto generated captions is huge. Uh, I think everyone should be, well, that should be a standard thing for anyone anyway. Um, the, the, do you think it's, uh, do you think there is possible to grow audiences on platforms? without massive paid yes yes it is so yes and no so in the section which we've taken out which is uh, declining trends there was a section called um organic reach now what you're talking about is organic reach you want to grow your platform through organic reach and not through paid advertising um traditionally that would be the way you know that would be the way that i push that's the way that i actually grew my platform is through organic reach however platforms are there to make money unfortunately right um they want to make more money than they actually give out money so one of the declining trends this year has been organic trend organic reach and the increase has been paid advertising there's also a downside through the paid advertising because the trust and transparency where people as soon as they see an ad they just scroll past or switch off and the upside to that is the increase in user generated content so the, the simplest answer to your question is, it is, is a little bit more difficult to grow an account through organic reach. However, I would look at clever ways of doing that, which is how can you create your or grow your uh, platform through collabor collaborations? So one of the ways that we've seen work fantastically this year is when we've collaborated with other theatres or other arts organisations or other creatives in other industries and we cross share and cross promote one another. We've seen a huge increase in, in uh, growth on their platforms. Um, there's nothing wrong in terms of paid advertising. I definitely recommend having a look at that, even if it's a very small budget of like one pound a, a day or three pounds a day, if you want. Um, but there are still ways of hacking the organic reach uh, algorithm by collaboration and by kind of working with as many people as possible, or even through influencer marketing through micro and macro influencers. Okay, I, 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 mean, I think we need to stop there and take a short break yes. at the end of the section. So thank you very much for all your, um, your insights and thoughts and sharing so far and to the audience. So we'll, we just have a, a five minute screen break um, and we'll be back at 11, oh, it'll be 12, 12 on the dot, we'll start again. So okay. in, enjoy these five minutes and have, you might have a think about the, if any of you have any other questions for Amrit or anything else that you want to discuss. Yeah, I'll definitely Brilliant. answer them okay. at the end or next section. Machine. Okay, so see you again at 12. Brilliant. So next we're going to be talking about resource allocation. Let's just make sure that this chat is on. Yeah, good. So sustainable engagement is what we're going to focus on next when it comes to resource allocation. Um, the arts landscape is evolving rapidly, uh, driven by technology, advancements, and changing audience preferences. 
It's important to adapt strategies to effectively allocate resources and create engaging content that resonates with target audiences. A few stats here, 72% of arts organizations believe that digital content is essential for their success. However, 40% of arts organizations have a dedicated content creation team, which is what a lot of you guys were talking about in the chat earlier. So let's focus on a few best practices when it comes to this. Let's quickly put this back up. Tip number one, define your target audience. Now, I know some of you guys would have done this. It's, you can define your target audience in a number of ways. You would have done this with your marketing strategy and hopefully with your social media strategy. But it's really important to understand your audience's demographics, interests, and online behavior. And you want to tailor your content strategies to their preferences and needs. So if you haven't already, I definitely uh, recommend searching for audience personas. Just do a quick search on, on Google and do that workshop within your uh, within your organization and figure out what your audience demographics is. So what your interests, what the online behaviors are, and then tailor your content to whatever they're interested in. Number two is set clear content goals. So you wanna establish specific objectives for your content, such as increasing website traffic, social media engagement, or ticket sales. Align your content creation efforts with your overall organization uh, goals. So there's nothing wrong with having multiple goals for multiple posts. So in fact, what you should be doing uh, when it comes to creating content on your platforms is having a variety of subject matters. So for example, one would be salesy or promoting your tickets or your exhibition. Two would be behind the scenes and create a sense of hype and excitement. Three would be educational and informational content. Remember I mentioned earlier, uh, TikTok, uh, their strategy is to take over Google and be the number one search engine eventually. So I, the algorithm is prioritizing informational and educational content. So top tips, did you know, a day in the life of, how can you incorporate those? Um, celebrations and uh, kind of inspirational type of posts. So in fact, if you think about those, just those four that I've mentioned, then you've got quite a varied different type of content that you're producing um, throughout your channels and you're technically reaching different types of people who will be interested in those types of things. Number three is prioritizing content quality and consistency. So you want to invest in high quality content that re reflects your organization's values and brand identity. You want to maintain a consistent content schedule to keep your audience engaged. So a few things here. Uh, number one is when I say high quality, I just mean high quality in terms of how it's been produced. It doesn't need to be a nice 4K camera. So the great thing about social media is it can be raw, it can be rough and ready. But the two things that people do not like when it comes to social media content, especially videos, is bad audio and bad lighting. Okay, They'll just switch off, they'll just scroll past. So as long as you can fix those, you have quality content. Then the next thing is, how does the content reflect your brand identity and values? Now, I'm working with a few organizations at the moment who are very, very set in their ways. Uh, they Everything is branded to a point where it's too much. They're using templates on the entire videos and um, they, they're struggling of being a bit more relaxed, okay, with their video content. You want to be, you want to have your brand identity. That could be through a logo at the end, that could be through text, but you want to also be relaxed and create content for the platform, you know, by adopting stickers and captions and uh, anything that's within those that, that's native to those platforms as well um, and again the the final one was consistent co uh, content schedule now alongside your social media strategy would be a content strategy and a content strategy includes a content calendar i definitely recommend if you haven't already to make it easy for your team especially if your team works remotely is to have a content cal calendar on a shared platform where you can all see exactly what's going on. Um, the biggest thing that I see work with remote users when it comes to uh, uh, an organization is doing a content audit and having this, uh, a shared content calendar. So what I mean about content audit is you, docu you basically document every type of content, or the top, top content really that you've produced, video, image, text base, and you put, you put it together into one shared folder that is shareable across your organization or the people who are in charge of posting or marketing. Traditionally, we have one person who has all the content on one computer in a random part of the UK or even world, in fact. And then it's really difficult to get those content off that computer or they might have left. So the way to avoid that is to have all your content onto one shared space, printer folders, images, videos, and text. Uh, if you want, you can even have a spreadsheet which talks about likes, post time, analytics. 
And then you want to focus on, right, this is all the best content that we've got. How can we uh, create a content calendar where everyone knows what's going on? Or we can jump on the bandwagon of a new trend, uh, but repurpose and reshare content apps has already done well, like evergreen content. So that's definitely something that you should focus on when it comes to prioritizing good and quality content. A um, few practical tips when it comes to all that. Number one, focus on social media. So utilize social media platforms. We know this from this, this talk that connects with your audience and you can share engaging content to promote your upcoming events. Number two, email marketing. So as I'm sure all of you guys have got an, a, an email a base you've got email marketing is one of the, one of the big ones in terms of short form content that you want to focus on but email marketing is a really nice way of kind of nurturing relationships and targeting email campaigns you can share exclusive content promote special offers and drive ticket sales which go alongside your user gener generated content or content creation efforts as well remember call to action always think call to action what is a call to action focus number three would be website optimization so you really want to ensure that your website is user-friendly, mobile-optimized, and visually appealing. So create inform informative content that drives organic traffic and enhances search engine uh, optimization. So um, there's two parts in this when it comes to website optimization and just general SEO here as well. Uh, a lot of organizations I've worked with have even thought about their mobile optimizations. Um, I know for a fact that a lot of people, majority of people, will be looking at websites through their mobile device. But if you're website isn't even made for uh, desktop and mobile a lot of people would just not bother because the text will be really, really small or they'll have to scroll left and right trying to figure out where they have to go to um so if everyone here just has a quick look search for their website organization on their phone and have a look you'll see straight away whether it's formatted for your uh, for mobile uh, or it's mobile friendly or not if it's not think about how you can change it uh, normally if you've got a website like WordPress or Wix, it's quite straightforward just to switch it or have a, a mobile version mm -hmm. that you can do. Step one, um, to, to do these, develop a content calendar. So you want to plan your content in advance to ensure consistency and timely delivery. So you can use tools like Google Calendar, Asana, um, just two of many type of tools that you can use. Um, a lot of organizations that uh, we work with just use Google Calendar. It's free. Uh, there's nothing you don't need to focus on paying for extra uh, software you can if you want to asana is another one that you can use uh, monday.com is another one that you can use where you have to pay a bit extra but you can just do a group shared google calendar share it with your organiz uh, organization and done you've got a con content calendar with links in with uh, analytics stats captions post times it's very straightforward to do number one you want to utilize social media scheduling tools um, so you want to automate social media postings to save you time and maintain consistency. Um, however, a big caveat here, <laughs> do not post one post six times on all platforms at once. That's not what I mean about this. You know, it's really important because I really don't like when people use Hootsuite or Buffer, for example, to do that exact same thing. Um, what you should be doing is prioritizing content for specific platforms and scheduling them so that saves you time okay so i'm not talking about cross cross posting exact same content the reason why that's not good okay i know that you might think why not because that's quite straightforward i'm saving time i'm, I'm, I'm producing one type of content sharing it six ways done the reason why that's not good is because every platform has their own style has their own language and has their own way of working so for example a certain caption length will not work on another platform certain hashtags that you use on one platform might not work on another platform as well so what you should be doing is just scheduling tools directly for instagram or twitter or facebook uh, or tiktok on individual platforms and then that's going to save you time as well definitely you definitely uh, utilize these tools but do not post it six times uh, and number three, I've mentioned this a number of times throughout this uh, presentation, is repurposing and reusing ex existing content. Really, really important. Uh, you don't need to reinvent the wheel, the wheel or create brand new content every single day. Uh, you want to repurpose existing blog posts, articles, or videos into new formats, such as infographics or social media graphics or short form videos. There's nothing stopping you from taking a long video that you've produced. It could be uh, landscape or portrait and splitting it up into different parts and sharing that over 
a few weeks if you need to. Um, those tend to do really, really well. Um, just make sure you, if you are offering a, a solution, make sure you answer that solution and don't do that whole thing about life for part two and not answering the question, life for part three and not actually delivering on what you're saying. You'll lose more uh, followers by doing that and and uh, and credibility than if you just offered a solution or answered the question in the first part in, uh, anyway. Cool. Next, let's talk about uh, tools. So we want to focus on uh, content creation tools. Oh, there is content creation tools. So um, I basically pulled together just about five uh, top uh, content creation tools that you can focus on. A lot of these you might already be using. Some of these you guys might not be using. So number one, we have Canva. So Canva is a user-friendly design platform for creating professional looking graphics, social media posts, and presentations. Uh, features, drag and drop interface for easy design creation, large library for templates, graphics, and photos. And the collaboration features for team projects is fantastic. So drop a yes in the chat if you do use Canva right now or no if you don't use it. Benefits are creating professional looking content without graphic design expertise, saves times and time and resource, and it maintains brand consistency across all platforms. Um, so just running through your yeses, well, a lot of yeses. So I think pretty much most of you guys are using Canva, which is fantastic. Um, the odd no. Brilliant. Good. Good. Um, Canva was the first thing that I used when I first started out on this and then uh, ventured out to kind of other ones. Uh, but it's definitely... <laughs> Canva looks too much, but it's not. It's, it's very, very straightforward. You get a free version as well, which is... I definitely recommend just playing around with it. You'll be surprised. And also, it works really well on a mobile phone as well. Okay, good. Next is Adobe Creative Cloud Express. This is kind of... I ventured from Canva to just the Creative Cloud in general, uh, which I preferred. But um, let me know if you guys use Creative Cloud Express. So it's a suite of creative tools for designing graphics, editing photos, and creating videos. Features a suite of creative tools for graphic design, photo editing, and video creation. Access to premium Adobe fonts and images and templates. And cross-platform capabilities. So the benefits are producing high-quality content for all your digital marketing needs. Access to a vast library of creative assets. And work seamlessly across different devices. So... Just have a look at your yeses and noes. Okay, more noes on this one, which I expected because the Adobe Creative Cloud Express is kind of the a bit more advanced and professional. Uh, you also have to pay for certain elements as well. Um, if you're going to be creating content on a regular basis, it's definitely worth looking at as well. But we've got a good amount of yeses. We've got noes, noes, noes. Cool, good. Next, we have some tools for AI. So we've got... Jarvis, uh, drop a chat in there, drop a yes or no in the chat if you use Jarvis. So Jarvis is a popular AI writing tool. The platform can generate all kinds of content at the click of a button, making it easy for anyone to create high quality written content. Features, generates creative text formats, including blog posts, articles, social media captions, and website content. Who? <laughs> yeah. Provides multiple writing styles and tones to suit your specific needs and offers long-form content generation for in-depth articles and reports. So the benefits from this is saves time and effort in content creation, produces high-quality content that resonates with your audience, and enhances your brand voice and consistency. So if you haven't, uh, I mean, if you know Marvel, you know what Jarvis is as well. It's not that. Don't worry. It's not going to take over the world. Well, I don't know. Um, it's Jarvis is, a, is a, a definitely a tool that I recommend you just having a look. So a lot of these tools... What is all about making your life easier when it comes to content creation or kind of yeah have do it write them down have a quick search uh try them out remember experimentation is the biggest thing here um you don't have to use them but you should be understanding what they do or what the capabilities are you never know you might like them but Jarvis, i've tried Jarvis; it's, it's very very cool um there's another ai tool which is very similar but is is very cool and it's called jasper uh, I'm, I'm waiting for a yes on any of these. Uh, there might not be many yeses, but let me know if you've ever used Jasper. Jasper AI is a writing tool that helps you easily create content. So you only need to provide simple inputs and Jasper will create, generate original high quality content. Features generates various content formats, including long form articles, blog posts, marketing copy and product descriptions, and offers templates and suggestions for different writing tasks. So the also cool thing about this is it provides SEO optimized content to improve search engine optimization. So um, a lot of organizations, not a lot, sorry, uh, 
with these last three, there's no such thing as a lot. There's a few organizations I'm working with that have tried these. And the biggest thing that they've liked from this is the SEO element. You know, they've seen a good increase on clicks to their blog post and even the captions with the algorithm because the SEO has been highlighted a lot more than just a standard caption. Um, benefits, producing high quality content for all your digital marketing needs, access to a vast library of creative assets, and you can work seamlessly across different devices, which is a, definitely a good pro. So just quickly running through anyone. Oh, Amy, well done. So one person had is a yes. Majority, I think, no, yes. Natasha, good as well. Uh, no, no, no. And I just pick up on a question that Amy asked earlier on, which was about yes. all, the question of you an AI using an AI tool to help you to write and authenticity. And how do you yes. <laughs> how do you ensure that you get you still feel it feels like an authentic voice? Not, That's it's not a question. Again, the audience might have a thought on it as well, but what's what are your yeah. thoughts on it? So that's the biggest question that we're getting asked at the I'm actually right now in the process of creating a AI course for the BBC on generative AI and this. And it's it's because obviously the BBC has got a huge focus on what they use and what they don't use. That's the exact question that we've popped up as well. The thing about AI is uh, depending on what platform you use and you generate text, it's, it will sound like a robot. However, AI is constantly learning to be more authentic. There are platforms out there that you can drop your text in, which has been generated by AI, and it will make it more human. But that is actually generated by an AI. It's strange. So what we're actually doing is we're teaching AI how to be more human. You take whatever you want out of that. Um, however, so the thing about AI is there's uh, the, the trick of using it is by being very, very specific with your prompts. OK, um, there's like, for example, you can have some like if you use Jasper or Jarvis, you can create a really good, authentic uh, sounding blog. But it needs you to teach it what kind of style you want how you want it to be written and, and include a, a bunch of prompts. Without those prompts, you're going to get a very generic, most likely overly worded uh, and fanciful worded uh, blog post. And we don't need that. We want something that's really honed to you. So every time I work with clients and we work with text generators like this, the first thing that we do, we input, this is our tone of voice. So I'm, I'm saying to um, these AI generators, part of our marketing strategy social media tone of voice is this so we write a tone of voice it could be um jargon field it could be simple it could be whimsical it could be direct it could be um fun whatever it is whatever your tone of voice is you write that in and say i want you to create an article based on our tone of voice this is our website and um, this is what we do and then really create direct prompts so it's personalized as much as possible to what you what you you are hopefully yep yeah, that makes sense yeah yeah Thank you. Uh, any other questions, please do drop in the chat and we'll, we'll answer it towards the end as well. We've got a Q&A section coming up anyway. Um, the last one I want to focus on is Social B. So Social B, drop a yes in the chat if you use Social B. Uh, Social B is an AI social media scheduling tool. So we mentioned content creation or scheduling. This is a scheduling version. It allows you to set up and pre-schedule your social media posts for Twitter, Facebook, uh, pages, groups, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. Features, schedules posts across multiple platforms, tracks social media performance and provides analytics, and manages and engages with your social media audience. Uh, the benefits is streamlining social media scheduling and management, gains insight into your audience and content performance, and enhances engagement and brand awareness. So again, we have things like Hootsuite, we have things like Later, we have things like... Um, Buffer, there's a bunch of other ones. This is actually an AI version. Now, a lot of these platforms are integrating AI directly within these platforms, um, but this has been quite popular on the just AI side as well. Um, so I think we've got majority of no's. I don't think we've got a yes on this. Uh, no, we haven't got a yes. Interesting, good. So yeah, these are definitely ones, please do write them down. You Obviously you can have, get access to the PDF afterwards as well. Um, experiment, have, uh, try them out and see if they work with your organization or not. Um, we do have a, before we go to the next section, I think uh, Linda wants to say something, then we've got a few questions that we can answer before we put I just, I just, just on the, um, on the scheduling and the sort of tools that help with the workflow and you've sort of given the example of social B, is that the yeah. one that you've tried to like best or is it, you know, I'm wondering why you picked that one when, or whether it's just the obvious contender, just interesting what sort of else is out there. 
Th there's loads out there. But the reason why I picked that one is because it's one which is proving a bit more popular. And when it comes to ease of easy ease of use, that's pretty much it. Um, oh. Because we've, uh, I mean, I've used Later, I've used Buffer and Hootsuite for, for years, a number of years. And I like them and I don't like them. Um, but what I find fascinating is what AI type of content, uh, sorry, um, schedulers can do. And what I found fascinating is the fact that it provides the uh, rich analytics, which is so much more important to me personally than mm -hmm. other platforms. The other platforms are a bit dry when it comes to analytics and I have to do a lot more work. This one uh, not only gives me suggestions on kind of what I should be doing, it analyzes the time of day that I should also be posting in real time. Then it looking at uh, other platforms are kind of static and looking at limited uh, research as well. But like I said, um, there is a lot out there. I'm just providing you, like I said, we could do three days on this whole webinar. Uh, I'm just providing you one or two just to kind of get you started in terms of experimentation. And then your goal is to be like, I like this. I don't like this. Let's try something else. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, but there's a there's a question which again I'm not sure if you feel that, who about copyright AI generated text and copyright which we know to be a sort of a big issue at the moment. I don't know if you've got a comment on that, but again we could probably um, point to some of our rights resources as well. Yeah, I mean the copyright is a very grey area at the moment because yeah. um, it's it's the copyright is either with the person who's generated the text or with the AI at the moment. If you're prompting something to be done, you have the copyright, you own it. But again, it's a great area where there's no official, um, I own this. It's, uh, and and that, basically that, that is a debate at the moment happening. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, there's a debate happening at the moment with the AI uh, who has copyright. There's nothing, there's no official law that has passed saying um, who exactly has a copyright, whether it's the AI or whether it's uh, uh, the user. At the moment, the basic... Um, response which is still in the gray area is the user who provided the prompts has the copyright but again it's easy to rip up and regenerate into a new format and then that person has copyright i think it, uh, again we'll, we'll put links into our digital rights resources because i think what as, as the space what we say is you know rights are right and that that you know the, the creators should have those but there are like legal cases going through and all of that at the moment so yeah. As you say. OK, so um, we've got just about five or six minutes left, Amrit. So I'm going to quickly go to the evaluation and then get you to come back and do your conclusions. So uh, we'll finish up there. So just to say to everybody, um, we've we've got um, a link to an evaluation for the webinar, which is what we always do. It just takes a minute or two, but we're going to put that link in now. So if you wouldn't mind just doing the evaluation now and then Amrit will come back and do his conclusions. As I say, we'll, we'll allow just two minutes. I think it's five questions for this. And it just really, really helps us to uh, plan the program, work out what we're doing well, how we could change things and so on. So just you've just got a, a minute, Amrit, to collect your thoughts and then I'll hand back to you. And I think we've covered all the questions so far. Hmm. yeah if there is any questions that i missed or if you answer, ask them early on in this webinar please do just drop them back in the chat I think um, good point Hannah. you should never be putting any personal details or any details that you don't want to be shared in the ai because it will be saved and kept hmm. yeah okay do you want to would you like to carry on Emma, and just sort of you know draw your conclusions what do you know thinking about social media trends for 2024 what what are your sort of final thoughts on all of that, the future outlook? Brilliant. Yeah, so let's focus on the future outlook now um, and look at kind of what you should be focused on going forward. A lot of them will be still focused on the trends that we did this year. Um, so definitely uh, number one focus is still on authenticity and transparency, big, big part. You want to humanize your brand as much as possible. Uh, showcase that the, uh, the people behind the brand highlight their personalities, passions and expertise. I don't see this often enough and I really want to see a lot more of it when 
you're celebrating the people in your organization and not just focusing on selling or promoting your your shows um storytelling and narrative so sharing compelling stories that resonate with your audiences and values and experiences user generated content massive at the moment encourage and curate content created by your audience to amplify authenticity we want to focus on community building so foster it foster a sense of community and belonging that engages with your audience on a regular basis and social responsibility so demonstrate your commitment to social causes and eth ethical practices as well which is i think really really key here um next focus which is definitely not going is short form video so focus on or try to kind of focus on attention uh, capturing attention quickly so grabbing users attention within the first few seconds using eye-catching visuals and captivating hooks um, leveraging authenticity so maintaining genuine and relatable tone of voice that will connect with the audience embrace creativity and innovation so what i mean about that is every platform is now kind of experimenting with ai and there's loads of very cool tools uh, green screen tools and, and effects that you can use experiment with them and embrace your creativity optimize for platform specifics so tailor your content for the specific features and trends of each platform so a video that you use uh, on TikTok will be different to reels depending on the stickers that you add and the captions that you add and the music that you add it's going to be quite different uh, and I mentioned this uh, before, you definitely want to track and analyze, analyze your performance so you can really understand your audience's pr uh, preferences and optimize your content strategy. Uh, next, focus on micro-influencer marketing. So identify the right influencers, really key here. It's not just about going out there and like picking one person. Is um, enjoy, employ social listing tools and influencer platforms to identify micro-influencers or macro-influencers who align with your brand's target audience and messaging you want to establish clear goals and expectations when you are working with influencers and marketers um it'd be good to just if you can drop a yes in the chat quickly if you've worked with influencers at the uh before if you oh, where's my chat gone chat's disappeared oh there it is uh if you've worked with influencers or if you've done any, any type of influencer marketing as well um so establish clear goals and expectations really important um when working with a lot, we have a love hate relation when, when people work with influencers because they haven't been very specific with the variables and the outputs. Um, really, really important. You really should be uh, setting clear goals and expectations. Co create content. So, collaborate with micro influencers to create authentic and engaging content. So, you don't have to remember I spoke about um, how you can, as a one man band, as a, as a small team, really collaborating with there's so many uh, micro and macro influencers out there who are open to collaborating with arts organizations and you've got some really really cool reach and engagement from these individuals as well um empower creativity so when you are working with these influencers do not stifle the creativity i uh, i have to say that because as a for me i've worked with on influencer campaigns myself and the last thing that you want to do is be really specific and be boxed into a um yeah, put into a box really when it comes to what type of videos you can create so be a bit more open let them be a bit more creative but co-create it with them as well and measure and, uh, all the analytics as well next uh, creative strategies for utilizing ai text generators so this is still going to be huge it's going to be a massive increase next year uh, identify content goals so why do you want to use these ai tools does it align with your content uh, objectives does it work does it read uh, well Write uh, clear prompts. So supply AI text generators with clear and concise prompts that outline the desired content style, tone, and key points. Uh, curate and edit the output. You should never be just creating any text generators and just sh sharing it as it is. You should be uh, changing it, tweaking it, uh, looking for accuracy, consistency, and brand alignment. You want to incorporate as many visuals as possible and track and analyze performance. And then finally, when it comes to understanding AI tools, um, this is a big one. There's going to be a lot more AI tools coming in next year. You want to know your audience. So when I say know your audience, um, how do they feel about AI? Who are they? Uh, what do they like? So if this, if certain or, uh, or, um, audience members and certain generations, by the way, find out that your copy has been created by an AI text, they'll just switch off or they'll lose all trust, but not all generations. For example, Gen Z's have a bit more trust or millennials have a bit more trust. Um, so yeah, understand your audience uh, a lot more. Create AI policies and best practices for social media. The last thing that you want is an employee or someone posting the AI generated masterpiece on your organization's Instagram account, for example, and receiving a negative reaction or someone installing a chatbot 
when your customers are used to human interactions. If you have rules and regulations in place for how to handle AI and the role it plays in your work, these potential nightmares can be avoided. So for example, there was a lot of organizations that got into hot water when they, so on Twitter, they had their customer service and they were used to a human response. All of a sudden on the website, they introduced a AI chatbot. And we know if you've used, ever used Amazon, chatbots or any, any other Amazon chatbot or sorry, any other chatbots, it can be very frustrating when you just want to speak to a human. So that kind of really uh, destroyed their brand very, very quickly because they didn't actually educate their audience that fact that we are now going to be using chat AI. Um, collaborate with artists and AI practitioners and share knowledge and best practices. So just quick conclusion, the social media landscape is poised for an exciting transformation in 2024 with the integration of cutting edge technologies like AI, AR, and Web 3.0. Brands and creators can will have a new found opportunities to connect with audiences in immersive and innovative ways. So embracing authenticity, creativity, and innovation will be key to success in 2024 and beyond. Thank you very much for an overview on social media landscapes in 2023 and 2024. Hopefully that was useful. Uh, any questions, if you've got time, we'll answer, but you will have access, no yeah. have time. You will have access to the PDF afterwards. Lovely. I'm really sorry to cut off the questions at the end, but we've we've run out of time, Amrit. So thank you as ever for sharing so much um, knowledge, advice, experience, recommendations, and to the audience for all for taking part. And um the next webinar we will have coming up on the 16th of January, we're looking at um, ethical risk and online safety. So some of those questions early on about sort of children and young people will be relevant to that. And that information will be coming out quite soon. So once again, thank you to Amrit. Thank you to everybody for taking part and um, we'll see you at the next webinar. OK, bye bye then. Thank you. Bye.